Hi, and welcome to PsyQ. And boy, do I have a treat for you guys today. I have possibly the smartest and coolest panel we've ever managed to put together. And we're going to be talking about big issues like scientific integrity, the march for science, and science in politics. So buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be amazing. Uh, my first guest is Eric Jarvis, who is a, a, a neurobiologist at Rockefeller and mm -hmm. studies the parts of the brain that help you learn languages. And so I asked, uh, I asked Eric just before the panel, how many languages do you speak? How many languages do you speak? One and a half. One and a half. <laughs> English and a little bit of Spanish. It's too much studying of the brain, so you can't, don't have time right. to study languages. Studying Sombra language. Wow, yeah. wow. So in <laughs> soon, soon to be 1.75 languages. <laughs> I ha also have Avatar Percher, who is a PhD at Rockefeller and the co-founder of Science Soapbox. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And on the far end, we have Sibria Stukes, who is a microbiologist and the assistant director to the Masters of Translational Medicine program at the City College of New York. Hello. Did I get your last name right? Perfect. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful <laughs> when that happens. So the first thing I want to talk about is and there's been a lot of people discussing is science political or should science be political? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like next topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why? Right. Well, political with evidence. And I actually think we need more scientists to go into politics. Mm -hmm. All right. Because politics is, I think, too fraught with decisions that are not based upon evidence. Good answer. Yeah. We're going to talk about scientists yeah. and politics, scientists going into politics as well. Yeah. Avatar? But with that in mind, I, science, I, the scientific enterprise, I believe, is inherently political. And there is, a, you mentioned the science theory and science practice. and it would be, would be naive to just say that to practice science is, is at the theory left at the theoretical level is just apolitical and should be refraining from anything beyond that. When in reality, there are all these considerations that go beyond what the empirical data tells us, and all of these components, such as where you put the money and who does the research and what you do with the results, all have a political bent to it. Mm. Sabria? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with everything that was just said. And something that I think about when people say to me science is political or science is not political is, you know, what are you actually talking to about when you s use the word science, right? Like, are you actually talking about the data? Are you talking about the people who do science? Are you talking about the environment that science is done in? Because even if you are talking about all those three things, you can definitely say that it is political, right? I mean, I think that some of the things that I think about, for example, if someone says, oh, well, science is just about the results, right, and the facts and the figures. And then I say, okay, but what about the facts and the figures that led to the Flint water crisis? And how is that not political, right? How were those results not shown to um, say that people's water were being poisoned? And especially, um, you know, underrepresented minorities' water were, was being poisoned. So I think that, you know, when people say science is political versus not political, you know, I would rather have a better discussion about what you are talking about when you talk about science. Well, great question. And when we talk about when we're talking about science broadly, there is a lot of um, concern at the moment about some of the legislation that's coming through under this new presidency and a new Congress and a new Senate. In particular, two bills that will affect the AP, EPA, one, the honest bill, which will affect what science can be used by the EPA and then the um, scientific uh, the EPA Science Advisory Reform Act, which will impact who can sit on the EPA's board and with a bias towards industry. So if there's people out there, you know, they're concerned about Donald Trump, think science is cool. What sort of issues that are happening in politics should they be concerned about? Well, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well, actually, you know, jump get, in. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I was asked to uh, be one of the speakers at the March for Science in D.C. And that really made me think about kind of answers to the question you just asked. And one of the things, you know, just why is this happening and so forth, it's the first time in history that uh, scientists have got together with the public to actually form a protest march in support of science. That alone is huge, mm. all right? And uh, why is that the case? Because the funding is being cut, mm -hmm. the scientific process is being threatened and challenged. The fundamental principles of scientific process are just basically being challenged mm -hmm. by the current administration. And uh, that is scaring a lot of people because we think that will just push everybody in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think any... Including all those cuts. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I was going to say, yeah. I think... Um, one, any bill that's going to challenge um, research that's done around, for example, climate change, but also any bill that's going to severely 
cut funding for basic research. You know, I understand the want and the need for um, more money to be going into cancer research, HIV research, malaria research, you know, but I think at the, at just the very basic research level, um, you know, we need money for for that kind of research as well. I mean, the basic research I mean in terms of how do, uh, you know, my research was on uh, fungal interactions with uh, macrophages. And some people might think, oh, well, why would we need to fund that? But I think the implications for what my lab was putting out could be put um, to use for other things. And if we're gonna have funding cut for that, then we might not know about any of those results. I'm glad you mentioned basic research because a lot of people want applied research. I want my new medicine, for oh, example. Absolutely. But things like the internet, GPS, vaccine, uh, the atomic bomb, these were all technologies that were either made or commercialized here in the United States and all off the back of basic research, government funded basic research. Mm -hmm. So if we cut funding to basic research as is being proposed, do you think that other nations will just fill the gap or do you think the world will just become less innovative? What, what do you think will be the implications of these cuts to basic research? I think you're going to see a mix of both because on one hand, there is not, you're not going to have a country say, oh, the United States is lagging behind on supporting basic research, now is our chance to step in. But on the other hand, you are going to have countries like China who are rapidly investing in their infrastructure. And regardless of what the US is doing, they will be building it up and they will be having more of a capacity to do research regardless of what the US does. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the, the other, one of the other considerations is whether industry will step up and whether they will start doing basic research, but they have no interest in investing in that. Nobody wants to put a million dollars onto a project in order to understand the basic component of cell division when mm -hmm. they have no understanding how that will help their bottom line. But that's the thing, I think that that is the beauty of basic research, right? If you can understand something like cell division, right, you don't, we don't know right now what the implications those results could be for uh, future discoveries. We don't know what that data, someone could read that data and say, oh, I have an, a cool experiment based on this very simple experiment um, that might be used for something like applied uh, science. Well, one of my, yes, go ahead. No, okay, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add to all of that, that um, basic research also doesn't have to be done just to understand uh, disease mm -hmm. or, or to be used for disease. Uh, government-funded science has given us the funds and the means to be able to understand just life, our planet, our universe, or our, our own selves and how we behave towards each other and how the brain works. Uh, so, so we can learn languages better. So, <laughs> yes, yes. So if all of that, if we cut the, that kind of funding, um, I think it's going to be de a decrease for this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and if others, other countries actually increase their funding for it, we're going to have people migrating out of the U.S., good talent, to other countries. And hurting yeah. American science. Hurting America. I'll go, you yeah. know, but uh, I'm, I'm a person of the planet. I'll go somewhere else if the funding is there. I heard a frightening statistic that China is investing more in innovation than the U.S. is, and soon China will be investing more in American innovation than the U.S. is. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be even more problematic with, uh, with the OSTP, the Office for Science and Technology Policy. As of the beginning of April, it's still unmanned or completely lacking uh, any body going from 135 people. Why? Uh, the, trans the administration transition. When, mm -hmm. President, when the Obama administration ended, the OSTP was 135 people, and as of the moment, once they've laid off the people who carried over, um, at least in the most recent op-ed I've read, it's one or two people. It's just empty. It's practically empty. And what you're talking about here is that the you were talking about a office whose whole purpose was to help the executive branch cope with all the technical and scientific considerations, and the question does emerge, and what are they doing at this point, and what are, how are they going to be addressing new things, such as gene editing? What is the, the what is the government stance going to be on the matter? And okay. this is a There's no new technologies. To don't worry, we don't need to deal with that stuff. <laughs> Computers are bad. I, I don't know what to say, but in that respect, yeah, it's it's the the gap is increasingly is growing increasingly larger. That's very scary. Um, one more thing I want to talk about, about what's under the banner of science is political, is diversity. So the March for Science faced some criticism for either being not inclusive enough. That's very kind of you to say some criticism. <laughs> <laughs> well, they also got some criticism for being too inclusive and having too much of a focus on diversity. And science has this reputation of being an old white man's sport um, that has got the reputation of boring old white men at the top. And we also then see as scientists that we should be concerned just with the data. We don't see color. 
we, we shouldn't have those sort of issues as part of our sci approach to science. We've got a diverse panel here. What do you guys think about diversity in science? Well, uh, myself being African-American and the first African-American professor at Rockefeller University and the second at the Duke University Medical Center. Wow. Uh, and when was that? When were you appointed? In 1998 at Duke University Medical Center. 1998 was the first time that an African-American... No, the second time. I'm, just, I'm the first, the, the second one to be tenured. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, when I left, there were two more after me. So four altogether. Huge so, team you've got there. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I've experienced a lot of this firsthand. And one thing I thought about this, because I was asked to talk about this at the march, and to me, this is a separate issue than the issue of budget cuts, because budget cuts can affect everybody. Mm -hmm. But independent of the budget cuts, science has a diversity problem. Mm -hmm. And it's diversity that allows people to have great success. Diversity in the techniques you use, diversities in the cultures that come together to do science. So that's a problem that needs to be fixed, no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and um, I guess I just am not so concerned about the numbers of diverse URMs in science because I know there are good people working on that. What I feel more committed to is how are we actually creating better environments for the um, URMs and women who are currently in STEM fields, right? I have some problems with championing this field, even though I went through it myself, um, and saying like, you know, okay, kids, like, come on into science. It might by and large be pretty toxic and wear you down, right? So I think that there is this problem where when we talk about diversity, we inherently, some people think that if you increase your diverse numbers, you are then automatically creating an inclusive environment, which is not the case, right? And so, I think for me the conversations that I want to be a part of are, um, okay, we want to increase our diverse population, but how can we make sure that what we're doing is, is good for the people that we're bringing in? But you don't think it's a serious problem that there's low diversity? Or I do think it is a problem, mm -hmm. but do you also not think it is a problem for the people who are coming in that they're leaving or they're not being supported or you know, they think that I shouldn't belong here? Oh yeah, but that, that's a problem, that's the reason, partly the reason why I don't think it is diverse. Well, the underrepresented minorities leave sciences at a higher rate, and so do women. Oh, absolutely, yeah. right? But partly I think because they feel like they don't belong. Right, and I think though that the, the megaphone is we need to get more URMs into STEM, but what about the ones who are already here? Mm -hmm. You're right. Making it more com a more inclusive environment, not just pushing the numbers into STEM. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can do both. I'm not saying it's either or. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just saying that I think the conversation tends to be the loudest around, we just need to increase our numbers, mm -hmm. instead yeah, of we need to increase our numbers and we need to make sure that the people who are already here are being cared for. Yep. Do you think that scientists should run for political office? I think so. I'm, and I'm Why? a minority view in this. Actually, one of my former postdocs is now the governor of Puerto Rico. Wow. Uh, Ricardo Rosello. Oh my gosh. And uh, because of that, I, I trust that he understands the scientific needs of the society and the community. Uh, okay. And I knew that he eventually wanted to be a politician when he came to my lab. So he yeah. came into a science lab knowing that he wanted to be a politician. Yeah, I, it helps that it's his unique. father was once the governor of Puerto Rico, too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's in his blood. That's right, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I encourage uh, people to come to the lab to think about doing other things uh, outside of the traditional academic track for two reasons. One is because there are not a, enough academic tenure positions mm -hmm. for, for everybody. So you have to do something. That's right. Yeah. And second, part of the problem we have in our society today now is that there's too much of a separation between the scientists and the public. Mm -hmm. And w you break down that separation by having scientists go into other fields that they can apply that science to science to like politics. Avatel, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this, because I know you were toying with the idea of you personally running for office as well, a scientist. I have rather strong opinions on the matter, and one aspect of it is really the academic pipeline, and we know from simply the data that a large portion of people who train as graduate students and even stay on for postdocs eventually leave. So one aspect of it is really where does all this 
where does this talent and all this intelligence essentially go? And I would, I would argue that a large portion of it, it should go to actually public service. They join labs in order to contribute to our knowledge and humanities capabilities in the end, and then they, trans, they fade off into the distance instead of being able to really making more of an impact out of academia. But if it's even a step beyond that, I would argue, is that all, all aspects of becoming involved in in some form of government on whichever level it is, at the end of the day you're vying for the decision of someone at the top. And I find myself frustrated with the notion that out of all the people in Congress there is only currently one person who has a PhD in science, uh, Bill Foster. And so the notion is it's not just becoming involved in policy but in, and in politics in general but also running for office and being a contributing member to the, to the legislative branch and actually contributing your knowledge to making proper and informed decisions, I think is absolutely critical for our, soci for our society. So vote for Bill. Vote for Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and Rush Holt is one of the other famous uh, politicians. He was the congressman for New Jersey, yeah. previously a physicist, so an awesome representative of science, uh, science and policy, um, and is now the head of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So he's come full circle, mm -hmm. science, policy, science again. There's a group that started called 314 Action, um, and their whole, their, I mean, they're the number for pi, 314, mm -hmm. and their whole mission is to encourage scientists and train them to run for office. So I don't think you're the only one that has the con those concerns, but do you think that scientists should be running for Congress? Do you think they should be running for their local council, or do you think is there a place that scientists belong more? I actually need to be correct. I, I need to be corrected on that matter sometimes because when I started thinking about becoming involved and in, in running for office in some manner, I was thinking about it on the congressional level because that is really where all the, the, the funding and support for research originates on the federal level uh, budget. And then I've been over that in part from the 314 Action Group for I was at their training and they're absolutely amazing. Um, the, the notion started emerging that the expertise that originates from your scientific training does not only need to be applied, it is not only relevant to matters that are related to scientific research, but rather becoming involved in all levels is increasingly necessary because you, the ability to bring your expertise to a decision about how to support investing in solar panels for your local community or what is really the basis or what is the proper way to go about science education on the state level is becoming more and more critical. So it, I definitely agree with that. I just want to add a quick statement to that. Is sure. mm. the, the fundamental principle is, is Congress and other legislators, right, are making the decisions of what science funding should be uh, given to us. Yeah. Right. All right, mm -hmm. all of us, I'm sure, are have been supported by funds allocated by Congress. Mm -hmm. And if you have those people making decisions about science and they're not scientists, you got a problem. Yeah. yeah. And that's the problem we have now, because yeah. all our budgets are being cut in yeah. the, across the sciences, because there's yeah. no one in there to advocate. Right. Yeah. So it's obviously going to be good for politics if we have more scientists there, hopefully using the scientific method to make good decisions. But do you think having more scientists leave the lab and go, to off, to con go off to Washington, do you think that's good for science, the practice of it? I mean, I think that question seems like, you know, there's a finite number of people going into science, right? So. I mean, I think there's always going to be a flux of people coming in and going and leaving for whatever reason, right? And I think that, you know, you don't necessarily have to, I, I think what's happening now is this bigger conversation of not should scientists go into politics, but should scientists start doing a little bit more activism, right? Or to be active um, in their local, um, um, like local um, politics or right or in, in Congress or things like that, and so I think scientists can do these things at all different levels. Um, and should they decide to leave, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be more scientists coming into the labs. Yeah. If sci if people that love science want to do something to support science and uh, and be active in politics or policy, they don't just have to run for office, of course. Mm -hmm. What are some of the practical things? Because I know there's a lot of people out there who aren't scientists that think, I, I want to protect science, what should I do? Well, vote, vote for people who support science. <laughs> 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 That's the best thing they can do. The yeah. second best thing they can do is actually learn about the science themselves. Mm -hmm. How? Where do they go? Um, <laughs> well, they can come and, uh, you know, to well, apply to universities, of course, and so, but listen to YouTube programs like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. I mean, I also think the other thing, too, is, is to just talk to a scientist, right? I mean, I think one of the things that I've always um, kind of not cringed at, but 
you know, I, I don't know if you guys ever got this, but I get all the time, oh, but you don't look like a scientist, yep. right? And I, no, and I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think people gen, <laughs> I think people generally think that is a compliment, but I've always thought about it as, well, but why not? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't I look like a scientist, right? And so I think that there is a image that people have of scientists that um, either we don't like to talk or we don't know how to have a conversation. And, that, you know, most scientists will love to talk about their research. <laughs> like, all the, you know, you probably can't get them to shut up about it. Um, so I think that is a very basic thing that they can do. I'd say engaging with the community is one of my first thoughts. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the Science Education and Policy Association. And one thing that we do is we encourage the community over at Rockefeller and the nearby institutes to become engaged and think of ways which they can start interacting with the public. That's one of the things that we focus on. And if people want to hear more about the work that SEPA does, where can they go? Uh, they can go to SEPANewYorkCity.org. Just before we move on to questions, what is your, you're actively a professor, so mm -hmm. you've gone through a postdoc yes, position, I Avital. I am a PhD student at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I have since graduated, and now I actually work in academic administration building this new master's program at City College. So all different kind of levels of the, the, the journey. Now, a lot of people don't realize what a postdoc is. So after you do your PhD program that you might have spent seven years doing, you usually go into this thing called a postdoc. Mm -hmm. I've not done one. What is a postdoc? Yeah, postdoc is a position that you take where you actually are supposed to know what you're doing and knowing how to design. After seven <laughs> years, <laughs> one would That's hope. That's right, yes. Yeah. Where you're no longer a student, but you're still getting somewhat of an education of how to manage a particular project. So basically, you're a scientist working in the lab of some other professor. Mm -hmm. And part of it was in order to have gained more expertise in an additional topic. Let's say you finish your PhD in one field, and you say, I want to be able to integrate this other element from another lab. And I'm going to spend some time there and really get some addi additional mm -hmm. exposure and training. And it used to be for around two to three years. And then the, the trajectory normally is that you might want your own lab. Mm -hmm. And so you might either have to do one or two of these postdocs. And postdocs can last for, what, like three to five years sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you then go on and get your own lab. I'm um, glad you mentioned and, it. Yeah. And it technically means postdoctoral research, so after your doctorate. After your doctorate, right. the literal Post, meaning. That's right, yes. Yeah. But it's not quite a tenured professorship, no, as we, a, as you might be. It's not a stable position. It's not a stable position. Mm -hmm. um, and it often requires a lot of moving around to mm -hmm. find an academic institution that can do what you're trained in. Um, so there's some issues around that it's not stable, mm -hmm. it's short term. Yep. You might have to move. If mm -hmm. you have a young family, that creates issues. If you've got to bring someone else with you. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things that I found was that there's 15% of people who have finished a PhD after six years, 15% are in that tenured professorship that they wanted. And probably the reason why they did their PhD. But 10% consider themselves unemployed. So are these postdoc positions actually going to guarantee these people that have spent seven years doing their PhD is a postdoc, does it get you into an academic job? Well, I've heard numbers, right? Now, I'm not going to say I know if this is true or not, but I've heard numbers that PhDs are the most employed, Ooh. including scientists. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're not all in academia, professors. We train them to become professors, but most of them go into other areas and still get employed. Mm. And the problem, I think, is that we should be have our minds open to train them in many different areas. Uh, so using their scientific skills. So if we know that they're probably not going to end up in academia at the end of the PhD, why are we training them just for that one That's thing? Right. Mm -hmm. We have an example of them here. <laughs> we have a wannabe here. Right? Oh, yeah. And they're doing just fine, I hope. Yeah, I, I, but I also <laughs> think it's um, that it's okay to change your mind. Mm -hmm. I think when people go into PhDs, there are they have many different reasons. And I know some of my colleagues went in very specifically knowing I want my own lab. And I know how hard it is. I know what the numbers are. I know what I'm up against, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then, you know, five and a half years, six years into their PhD, they're just like, OK, like, let me pump the brakes here and actually really reevaluate where I am in my life, uh, kind of how I see myself. And that sometimes can change one's view of, of whether or not they go into a postdoc or not. I mean, I know for me, I had many conversations with my PI. Um, about what else can I do besides doing a postdoc. And I think, to your point about training um, graduate students for something else, some PIs are very set, like, nope, you get your PhD, and then you go and get a postdoc, and then you go and get into a lab, or you get your own lab. And so I think the conversation 
needs to include PIs to say, sometimes your graduate students aren't going to want to get postdocs, so how do you train them for other jobs? How do you allow them to maybe blog on the slide, um, do science communication, do podcasting? Because some PIs are like, nope, you're in your lab, you do your research, and you write papers, and that's it. Very focused, despite right. the fact that people leave. So the jargon here, the terminology PI meaning uh, oh, principal investigator. <laughs> principal. Okay, for those who don't know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for translating. Okay, yes. I have a friend who says he translates science into English. So, right. <laughs> so these um, postdoc positions I want to talk about because it's kind of a rite of passage. You've got a PhD, you want to work in science, you've got to do a postdoc. But they're traditionally not very highly paid. What's the difference between the amount of money that a postdoc would be getting compared to, say, if they'd gone into the private sector? Is there a big difference there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Usually, I think from personal, personal anecdotal experience, and I think I haven't heard anything that contradicts this debate, is that usually you can easily double your salary in one night from transitioning from a postdoc position to anything from being, being entering pharmaceutical com a pharmaceutical company, working as a science writer. Uh, it really is a major cutback and to your personal, ab your ability to start, let's say, a family and the, and, or to save money yeah. is something I'm problematic. I'm not really sure. I mean, so I agree. You almost double your salary. If you get out of Go into mean. industry, mm -hmm. right, or some other. Yeah. Less if yeah. you're teaching, for sure. Mm -hmm. but, but just the nature but of teaching the is not going to double your salary. No, it's not. Less, yeah. less for. Yeah, you're yeah, going to work in the pharmaceutical industry. But so. I look at it this way, right? Uh, and maybe I'm going to be a different opinion here because I've now gone the academic. <laughs> I'm biased. You're I'm biased. Professor. Postdocs I'm, are I'm great. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, I would say on my postdoc salary, actually, even on my undergrad, my graduate school salary, I had, uh, had two children. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was a postdoc when I had uh, the second, mm -hmm. my wife that is, and she's a scientist as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, was she a postdoc too when she had the child? She was a postdoc, so she was a little older than me. She was a postdoc, I was a graduate student. Wow. Yeah, so she took me under her wing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what he discovered is that uh, the money you can make is not a whole lot, okay, but it is, it is enough to live comfortably. Mm -hmm. And when you become a professor, of course, then it's more. But uh, it, what what really matters is do you make enough to live comfortably and be happy at what you're doing mm. as opposed to make double that salary and be unhappy now of course there's a relationship between the amount of money you get and happiness mm -hmm. but there is a balance there mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if science has achieved it but in my case it did aside from the money issue because mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it's it's enough but not as much as you could make. Mm. But another thing is that postdocs are inherently unstable in that they're usually term limited. It's a year, two years, three years, maybe five. But you then have to move. And you often have to move to get that postdoc in the first place. So from your experience, was it disruptive having a wife and a family and then you have to pick the your The move was disruptive. And in, in any kind of high profile career where both people are pursuing something like that, you can have this two body problem, as you call it. Mm -hmm. And it definitely was disruptive. Uh, and so we had to adjust, we had to figure out, uh, could we get a, uh, what do they call that when you're a spousal or whatever? Sorry. <laughs> oh, a spousal guys, oh, allowance? No, uh, you know, um, I forget the terminology, but basically, you know, it, what we do in science, now I sit on these uh, committees to hire p scientists, to mm -hmm. hire postdocs into faculty positions. And if the, the husband or wife is also looking for a position, we have to try to find out if somewhere in the university can we find a person for that spouse. Oh, wow. I mean, a position for that spouse. So you have to, no, no, not a person for that yes, spouse. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a university is actually helping to get couples that, and keep them together. That's happening more and more. Now that you have more women going into science, instead of you know being the stay-at-home mom, right, they mm -hmm. want to be the scientist too. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think for one of the things that for me is what I find so frustrating is that what the postdoc essentially represents for the 80 plus percent that don't enter academia is that this is reflective of the end of the line for them mm -hmm. in academia. And there is no option really in our current structure to enable them to continue doing research. If you don't want to head a lab and you're done with your postdoc and you weren't able to get that desired position, you're essentially done. Mm -hmm. get and out. Get out. And then if you're talking about moving, you're talking about transitioning careers, and thereby I find it is truly problematic. And I have, I dislike that nature of uh, the academic structure the way it is right now. Yeah, and I think that, I, yes, I, I totally agree with you because I think that it's also a very, it's not an easy decision to decide to not do a postdoc. I mean, it wasn't for me. 
I think for some people, they just know after the end of their PhD, they're just like, I'm out. There's other things I want to do. I want to make money. Um, so I'm going to go consulting. I'm going to you know, do all these other things. And I think for me, we don't do a good enough job about talking about the emotional um, aspect of these decisions where, you know, I said to myself, I spent over 10 years, right? I mean, I was working in other labs before I started my um, grad school uh, career, but over 10 years doing wet bench research, really loving infectious disease research, loving being in the scientific environment. And then I had to say, I have to close the door on this because I have to do something, I'm going to do something else. And it is, if tomorrow I wake up and say I want to be back in a lab again, it is very impossible for me to get another job in academia because they're going to say, well, what have you been doing for the past two years? Do you know about this new technique? Um, and so I think that there Maybe needs to continuing to publish. Yeah, right? absolutely. So I think that there's, I think you're absolutely right. I think that some people continue to do a postdoc because they say, well, if I don't do this, then I have to leave science. In and I can't capacity. come back yeah. for, a, for a, a long time. And, and that's, I don't know, it was very heartbreaking for me, actually, um, to decide not to, to, to leave science in this way. So it sounds like postdocs are tough, not great pay compared to other things you could be doing at that age. Sometimes you can bring a spouse, but sometimes you can't. There seems like there's a lot of challenges with the way the system is set up now. I liked that you mentioned the solution of like universities will now try and keep couples together. Mm -hmm. What can we do? What sort of things would help make this situation better? What should we as a scientific community be doing to make it easier for scientists to stay in science without having to take those pay cuts and and face those other challenges. Well, pay, pay, I think pay postdocs more. Yeah. I think because I think that, I mean, basically grad students are free labor for PIs, right? We're pretty cheap, um, and we publish the papers, and they go to conferences, and they get to talk about our work. We help out with the. <laughs> 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 I, uh, but I, but I do think you know to your point, and I hate kind of distilling lots of things down to this almighty dollar, but I think we need to be paying our postdocs more. Building upon that, uh, uh, I think your specific choice of words was really uh, poignant, was that what can the scientific community do? And one of the things that I think the scientific community needs to be more aware of is that if they don't do something, it'll be done for them. And in this case, if they really mistreat an entire stage of the academic career, something is going to change and they may not like the way it's done. And then there was an actual example of it where in the past year, one of the in the previous administration's um, legislation was that you minimum, m the minimum amount paid for the amount of hours worked. And that was essentially forcing the scientific community to pay their postdocs more. And then that eventually was uh, blocked by, by the courts and it didn't go through, but it, it resulted in this brief rift in which all the academic institutes were having something forced upon them that they did not like at all. And you could see the pushback some were saying that postdocs are only trainees. I was like, really? So seven years wasn't enough in order to really <laughs> become a PhD. An, yeah. for a PhD. Um, and so I, I think really the scientific community, what it could really do is get its act together on its own end. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to all of this to say that uh, um, if the public could support science more, that would force Congress to invest in science mm -hmm. more, which would increase the salaries and pay people for their due worth. Mm -hmm. um, and the scientists, as you're saying, can help the public do that by reaching out to them more, as we're doing here. That's a good incentive. If scientists reach out to the public, the mm -hmm. public supports science, the Congress mm -hmm. will support science, we'll be able to pay our people more. That's right. So it all comes back to scientists engaging with the public. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us in this amazing panel. We're so lucky to have these three incredible guests. If people want to know more about you, where can they check you out, Eric? They can go to JarvisLab.net and look us up at Rockefeller and read all about the science we do and support us. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Avatar? Uh, I am one of the members of the podcast, Science Soapbox, so you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and you can find me through the translationalmedicine.ccny.cuny.edu website um, to learn more about the program that we're building, which trains uh, scientists and engineers in the process of uh, bringing a scientific idea to market. Incredible work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on PsyQ.